And then there are people, of course, who have been abused in one way or another. Uh, and, but, but, you know, I call that the bad pain, the bad trauma. There's good trauma and bad trauma. The good trauma, we kind of bring on ourselves and overuse things uh, uh, that shouldn't be that overused or stretched out. So many traumas along the way are very, very common. Uh, but remember the big ones. The, the, so the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not necessarily that surgery or that childbirth or that one accident that caused that person to end up with this particular pelvic pain, regional pain syndrome. It's a combination of them living close to the edge for a lot of years and then going over that edge when even something minor happens. Mm -hmm. One of the books that I, that I read myself that I don't really recommend for the average person because it's pretty dull, written by a trauma specialist, but it basically tells a story about whiplash. And in the whiplash world of doctors who work with neck pain, there was always this mystery of why do about 15 or 20% of whiplash people not get better? 80% of them are better just like any other sprain in six or eight or 10 weeks. They wear a collar or they may have to, you know, limit their motion of their neck. But then 20% of them kind of go downhill for no apparent reason. Everything starts to hurt, not just in their neck, but their low back might be starting to hurt. Even pelvic pain might be starting to flare up. And those are the people who have that genetic predisposition who are living really close to the edge to begin with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you're even very close to that edge, you don't even notice the number of little aches and pains that you have. Because yeah. you may be taking care of one or two children and have a job and, and um, you know, trying to, trying to be comfortable with the sexual activity you're having, all of these things uh, and more. And, and then we get into COVID in the last few years. So all of these stresses from the outside and the stresses from the inside just add up. And so many people are living on that edge, especially in these last few years. Mm -hmm. But even way before COVID, I'm not blaming it on COVID, but just stress in general. We have a very stressful world and a very stressful environment. And too many people, you know, are type A personalities and have to do everything, get through their entire list every day. And that just adds, that just turns the dial up even further for their central and their peripheral nerves. Yeah. I remember you had me get my cortisol level checked. So that being the stress yeah. hormone and it was high and you know, I don't, I've had periods of time in my life where I'm aware of how stressed I am, but at that moment, I was like, I haven't been stressed at all. And then I just realized, I think my entire life, I've just been just chronically stressed. And I'm that person who's always like tapping my foot or, you know, my knees yeah. are up and down. Like I just yeah. feel yeah. like my nervous system has always had that dial turned up and I didn't yeah. realize it until I started seeing you and, you know, you put me on that, um, gabapentin to turn that dial down. And I think that has been helpful. Um, but it's definitely a work in progress. It's not like a yeah. switch you can just flip or fix with medication. I think it takes yeah. a lot of, uh, just personal work. Like I've been doing a lot of journaling, a lot of, I, I tried using the curable app and doing that relaxation. And I think it, it takes some time, but it's definitely possible to get to a place where you get that, that nervous system dialed down. Yeah, no, that's exactly true. And that's what and that, and that, all of our patients know when I do this, <laughs> yeah. where, are, where are you in that dial? Uh -huh. That metaphor is a good metaphor to use uh, any type of imaging of your pain yeah. is helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you journal and when you try to draw a picture of your pain or do anything like that, which a lot of people probably have been told to do. Um, it kind of helps to register the reality of what actually is going on 
and kind of brings you back to um, acknowledging that it's a real thing. Mm -hmm. Because what we tend to do is dissociate from pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. That word dissociation is extremely important in the work that I do and how I think about treating people because that dissociation can be really, really hard to break back Mm -hmm. from. Okay, so people are who have ongoing stress, ongoing trauma, ongoing difficult relationships, difficult job, difficult family members, difficult, you know, whatever it might be, their dial is constantly up regardless of whether they have a good day or a bad day with their pain. But some of the good days are when they're away from some of that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. we hear people that just miraculously go to the shore for a few days by themselves or with their best girlfriend and come home and say oh my god that whole three days I didn't feel my pain at all Mm -hmm. it's not that it wasn't there it it that that's the big thing about chronic pain too that your audience should hear is that chronic pain as opposed to acute pain doesn't represent hardly ever the type of tissue damage that it feels like. Okay. That's a, that's a concept that's, that took me a, a while to, to be comfortable with. Mm-hmm. If so, and the best way to think about that are the extreme ends of the spectrum, like phantom limb pain. Obviously, and most people have heard of that. And some people have talked to people that have lost a limb. So if you have no foot, but you're coming to the doctor saying, my foot is on fire. And the doctor looks and, you know, over the centuries, over the millennia, uh, if somebody was saying that, they had to believe that it was mental just because of the trauma that they had gone through losing their leg or their arm. Mm -hmm. However, functional MRIs, which are research tools lighting up the brain in different colors, everybody has kind of seen those in, in magazine articles and stuff they actually show that patient's foot where it would be represented in the brain lighting up. And on the day that they don't feel it on fire, it quiets down. Mm -hmm. So it's an actual real change in the nervous system and in the brain when that person is feeling that. Now, that doesn't mean that we're relating a loss of a limb to pelvic pain but it's the same concept on the other end of that because the brain is fooling you. The brain is saying there's so much pain. There's so much signals. There's so much danger coming up to the midbrain here that the little red flags are waving, waving, waving. It has to be something really bad. And therefore I am not going to sit because if I sit, I'm going to damage it even more. And then when I tell people, guess what? You're not going to damage those nerves anymore by sitting. It may hurt a little bit. It may flare you up, but it is not dangerous to sit. Mm -hmm. It is not dangerous to touch that area. It actually does hurt and it's a real thing and it'll be lighting up up here, but you're not making it worse because the tissue probably has already healed or it's at a lower level and your brain is saying it is, okay? The inflammation is obviously there when we're talking about vestibulitis because you see the redness, you see sometimes swelling, you see some discharge that comes because of the inflammation. You see a lot of things, it's a real thing going on, but we can treat those things. And sometimes when people don't have that huge overlay of the dial being turned up so much and so dissociated because of so much trauma in their lives, the treatments go very quickly and very um, uh, surprisingly well, faster than we think. Sometimes in two months, a lot of the pain is down to a manageable level. Other people take six months to a year, even in the best of circumstances when we're doing everything and they're trying to do everything they can because they still have ongoing trauma going on. And, and so, you know, some people can't do anything about that. 
not everybody can quit their job. Not a, you know, most people don't want to leave leave their family in a lurch, or even if it's high, highly uh, dysfunctional. Whatever it might be, there are things that we, as the treaters of the pelvic pain, shouldn't be. We we should be picking all that up and referring to the appropriate. A lot of our patients already have a counselor. A lot of our patients are already going to a mind body relaxation. Uh, class or a yoga class or uh, Pilates class or, you know, mindfulness class or all of these other things. And that's what I mean by utilizing anything for that person that will work. And, and those, those modalities, by the way, uh, depend on the person who's doing the modality and the person who's receiving the modality. And I always tell people, if you go into an acupuncturist or if you go into a Reiki um, uh, person or if you go into a Pilates group, if you don't feel right at the end of that first session, if you don't feel like you've been listened to, if you don't feel like they're connecting with you, if, you don't, if it feels like they're doing the same thing over and over with everybody, find somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because that's not a good fit. And that person may be a wonderful fit for five other people, but not for you. Right. Okay. And that's why often people give up very quickly on various modalities. The thing is that you said it yourself a few minutes ago, none of this is overnight. It's a slow incremental dialing down of things that sometimes took decades to build up. Mm -hmm. Not just the IC, but the IC being a trigger for those nerve sensitivities and muscle spasms that are going on in the deep pelvis. Mm -hmm. The actual pain itself, inflammatory pain, whether it's in, in areas that you can actually see the inflammation or whether it's inside the, the lining of the bladder, it's inflammation that's occurring because the acid nature of the urine in IC is irritating the underlying tissue of the bladder and urethra. And even when people void and he, the urine itself touching the vestibule and wiping also causes more sensitivity. So all of that is an actual inflammation without infection. And so people, always should insist on a culture and not just a dipstick and getting back to some basics here uh, about IC because so many people are treated with antibiotics unnecessarily, which is not good for your system, not good for your GI tract, not good for your immune system, not good for a lot of things. Uh, and you definitely, if you possibly can, not be treated until the culture comes back. You can use drink more water, Use more aloe vera capsules, use more, you know, avoid your acids for those few days until the culture comes back. And it's not the worst thing in the world when the dipstick is done and it's, it shows nitrites and it shows all that stuff uh, to go on something and then come off as soon as the culture is reported back to you. That's not, that's, that's not so I'm not saying never be treated. And we actually give people, in many cases, a slip. It's a returnable slip, like an as needed slip mm -hmm. that they can, because invariably it's Friday night or Saturday or Sunday that these things flare up mm -hmm. and they don't want to call the doc or they can't reach the doc and you don't want to actually go to the emergency room because you know the hassle that's going to be. And so you try to find some old pills that are in your cabinet that you didn't finish using last time. Uh, and I'm sure you know, a lot of people are relating to the, what I'm saying here. Uh, but if you have a slip, then you, you almost every, every place almost except for Christmas and Thanksgiving day is open, you know, almost, almost 24 hours, you can find a place where you can get a, a blood test or a urine culture, uh, leave off your, your specimen. So we give people a returnable thing that they get the specimen and they give it back to the person. And that's very, very helpful to have. So you don't even have to necessarily make an appointment. You just go to the lab and, and drop it off. Yeah. Oh. And 
I've noticed that in, you know, support groups that I'm in people saying that they went on antibiotics, but they didn't have an infection, but the antibiotics helped them to feel better. Can you explain why that's happening? The, the most likely reason that that happens is that the time it takes to heal with a real UTI is usually three to five to seven days, which is why medications are given over that period of time in general. Also, I see flares usually last three to five to seven days. Mm -hmm. So when you feel better, it's not necessarily because there was an infection. And oftentimes we look back and, and find those cultures and find them to be negative. And the person took Keflex or Macrodantin or whatever it might be and got better. It wasn't because of the antibiotic necessarily at all. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's the issue. You have flares and they come and go, and they're gonna go away just by drinking more and by waiting it out mm -hmm. and calming and letting things calm down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that people, makes sense. But, that, but that's why a culture really should be done regardless. And the follow-up on that culture should be done because you go to the emergency room, if they get a culture, they, first of all, they do a dipstick. If they do the dipstick, it's often positive because the dipstick shows red cells and white cells and inflammatory debris and so forth, because there is a lot of inflammation. But the, but it's a, a it, the culture two days later is negative because it's not a bacterial infection. It's a flare of the IC. So it's important for people to do those cultures, even if they turn out to be negative for a period of time, to kind of tell, learn their body learns a difference between an IC flare and an actual bladder infection. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not that no bladder infections occur from time to time, but not as many as most people think. Mm -hmm. Then there's a subset of people as they get older, and I was told this by one of the leading IC experts at University of Pennsylvania. He, he was back in the 80s and 90s uh, from uh, Penn. That did a, they did a lot of research on IC back then at Penn. Uh, that there is a subset of people in their 60s, 70s, and 80s who have had IC over years who start to get real infections over and over. And I, I had somebody like that, and I sent her to him a few years ago, and he wrote a nice letter back and saying, uh, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do about that most of the time. You just have to treat the infections each time they happen. Uh, and uh, and just deal with it in that fashion. And I, I guess the theory is that because of the long-term damage in somebody who wasn't treated appropriately for many years, um, there, there is a kind of a permanent uh, way in which those bacteria, because ba get bacteria getting into the urine, uh, into the bladder is not that uncommon, but most of the time people just pee it out mm -hmm. uh, and low levels of bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a lot that could be said about all the different genetic testing that's being done now to see the genetic codes of the different bacteria. I'm not a big fan of a lot of those tests because uh, almost always they come back positive. Are you talking about like the microgen testing? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. I wanted to ask you about that. Yeah. Can you elaborate? I'm not, I'm not a big fan. I'm not saying it's, 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 um, a modality that isn't helpful in some cases, but for the vast majority of people, I don't, I don't, the ones that I see, people get it done themselves in many cases yeah. without a prescription and then bring me the results or bring their urologist or their PCP the result. And what do you do with the result? If it says there's three different bacteria here and here's all the uh, antibiotics that this person should be on. Do you give them three different antibiotics or, and you trust that test just because there was a genetic DNA um, marker found in that test? I think we're, we're, it's too early in the evolution of that type of testing to use it on a routine clinical basis. 
right. is what I'm saying. I think I think as time goes by, and it is um, sorted out better, and larger research studies are done, um, that it's better to stick with a routine type of culture that we know for sure we can rely on. Yeah, there's a big um, subgroup of people who believe they have the chronic UTI slash embedded infection. And I'm, I'm in the big Facebook group for that, just observing. And, um, there's a big practice over in, um, the UK, I believe that treats people for the embedded infections. And I think there's somebody down in Louisiana who does it too. But yeah. there's really outside of those people, not many doctors who are willing to treat that type of um, infection with the the low dose antibiotics. I think that's the treatment that they're going for, right? I think so. Yeah. Or multiple antibiotics because some of the reports that I see, the different bacteria that they're picking up. Some some are susceptible to one ba- one antibiotic and others are not. Right. So do you, do you give two or three antibiotics? That's the thing. It, almost always something comes back. Mm-hmm. If nothing comes back, that's helpful. Right. But at least the ones people bring me <laughs> and that are confusing are the ones that are positive. Mm-hmm. And then we don't know. And the thing is that because of what I was explaining earlier about our program, is that when people come in and say, my IC pain is flaring, it often isn't the IC that's flaring. It's some of the nerves that are in the pubic area, super pubically over where everybody knows their bladder is. Mm -hmm. There's nerves in there, as you remember when we examined you. Uh, And again, nothing, because I don't remember exactly what we found with you, but a lot of people have nerves that come from way up at their diaphragm that wrap around and go down and get uh, more dense as they go toward the middle of the pubic area and, and heading right toward the pubic bone and then ultimately to the, gen- to the genital area in the midline. Mm-hmm. So people are sensitive there. And when that sensitivity flares up and even when I'm just poking very lightly way over on the sides of the lower abdomen, like along the whole bikini line from one hip bone to the other, just very gently, even way out to the side, some people will say, oh, that's my bladder pain. Mm-hmm. You're, you're touching my bladder. I say, well, no, your bladder's deep inside in the middle. We're way over here. But your brain is saying, that's my bladder pain. Uh-huh. That's so and, interesting. And then we put a little bit of local anesthetic under the skin there. And lo and behold, that bladder pain goes away. Uh-huh. Wow. So, so that, I mean, that's what we find because that, that's what I've been doing for 20 years. And I've learned more and more and more why some people have these extra added uh, issues that fool their brain. And because they've been told over and over and over, that is your bladder pain. Right. And, and all those people who put, we just talked to somebody yesterday um on on a video call who's got burn marks from her um heating pad so Mm -hmm. a a lot of people relate to that using a heating pad super pubically over the bladder thinking is their bladder pain that is being helped some people use it so much that this this young woman was telling us that she got such a horrible burn that the dermatologist has to treat it in a certain way because it really, really got burned and it can cause some permanent scar, scarring and discoloration in their lower abdomen. Uh, but it helps. That's why they're doing it. Now, is it helping the bladder or is it helping the neuromuscular tissue that's in between the skin and the fascial tissue and the network of nerves that are coming down in the fascia and, you know, overlying the bladder? Right. And that's what I'm saying is that there's a lot of people, and even internally, uh, if an obturator muscle is too tight on one side or the other, which is right next to the bladder on either side, if that goes into spasm or anything around the bladder goes into spasm, it may not be the IC 
itself that's causing the pain. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so many people that have either, and that goes the other direction too, because we see people who've been treated for pedental neuralgia over and over and over because they can't sit and they've gone and gotten uh, all kinds of blocks under big machines and so forth and have not gotten better. Um, it turns out it's not their pedental nerve. It's, it's maybe that other nerve that goes down next to the sciatic in the backside and comes around to the perineal area and perirectal area called the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. So sitting pain is, is confusing too. So, th so these days, you know, 15 years ago, hardly anybody knew what the pudendal nerve was. And now I see people coming in misdiagnosed with pudendal neuropathy or having had surgery on their pudendal nerve. And so either, either getting worse or certainly not helping them. Mm -hmm. So basically it's a matter of discriminating which muscles, which nerves, which organ, and which activities and what history that person has had and what their midbrain is telling them at that particular moment when they're flaring. So is there a way to retrain their brain? Yes. How that, can you do that? Oh, boy, that is, <laughs> there's, actually, there's actually a website called retrainpain.com. Um, but, but the whole point of the neuroscience and the understanding of the neuroscience, certainly in the arena of pelvic pain. And I think it must go for all other types of pain as well, is to turn that dial down. And when we say turning the dial down, it's actually reducing the sensitivity of the same signals because on Tuesday, the exact same signals might be recognized up here as a nine out of 10 and a horrible day when somebody's in bed with a heating pad on. And Thursday, they feel almost nothing or a two out of, th two out of 10 or a three, which is very manageable. What's the difference between Tuesday and Thursday? They rack their brains to figure that out. What did I do? What did I eat? What did I, what did I experience? Right. It was different on Tuesday and Thursday. And it may, if they don't understand if they're in the early stages of these things and they don't understand that taking a glass of orange juice or cranberry juice or a glass of red wine the night before, within 10 or 15 minutes, the pH of their urine is just enough over the edge that it puts them into this cascade of a flare. Their bladder may flare up, but it also then clenches their pelvic floor, which also may trigger off one of the nerves that I was talking about and boom, they're down. Right. And nothing obvious has changed, except maybe they smelled something or they tasted something or they saw something on TV or they heard a song. That Some people can back. just look at a picture of a tomato or an orange and yes. their brain immediately just. Right. Yeah. Let, let alone your brain remembering worse things than that. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's definitely such a complex thing, but in my line of work, I have people who are experimenting with foods and beverages and trying those trigger items. And I think a big struggle or obstacle that they face is that fear that they have, because maybe in the past yeah. they have had a flare from that item or they yeah. think they had a flare from that item. So I think yeah. there is a huge mind body connection there that they can just kind of think themselves into a flare or, you know, yeah. it's just that brain trying to protect your body. And you're seeing that as a nutritionist, when you're talking about the food aspects and the nutritional yeah. aspects, I see it in the whole spectrum of people. Um, when somebody is, when your brain is expecting to have pain, it's more likely that the dial will go up. And that expectation is real. That's a real chemical change. And that's why I was talking about the functional MRI is that on, a, on that exact same bad day, that area of the brain that represents that part of the pelvic area that's hurting is lit up like a neon sign. And what 
what might have done that? Something very, very minor might have done that. That is, there's there's too many variables to figure out all of them. Right. And just by looking at what you're eating and drinking and not what you're thinking and experiencing through all of your other five senses mm -hmm. and living in this crazy world where we're isolated and uh, we're afraid to give you know, vaccines to our kids and we're afraid that they're going to get sick. Uh, we have two grandchildren right now who are tested positive. And so the whole family is affected. The father can't go to work. The mother, you know, they, all of these things are constantly, and that's just one example over the last three years. But just think about all family dysfunctions that are occurring. There, there's hardly a family that doesn't have something going on whether it's the mother-in-law, whether it's some cousin, whether it's somebody bugging you, whether it's a sister or brother that just is a pain in the ass, whatever it might be, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, the, the, you know, life goes on and that may be enough of a trigger because you're living so close to that edge on the other days. You can live right here and feel like it's a two, but then it just goes here and it's a nine. So that edge feels like it explodes. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're going from no tissue damage or inflammation to all of this damage, but your brain is saying that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. And there's a, a research after research showing that Tuesday and Thursday, there really often is no change at all where the pain is experienced coming from. What the difference is, is how is it received? Mm -hmm. Is it received like a rock concert where a guitar is being played on the stage about a half a mile from you? Is it you're so far up in the stands that you can barely see the person playing the guitar, but the entire room, the entire stadium is, is vibrating because of the amplifiers. That's what the nervous system does with these signals. It amplifies the whole even tiny little signals that that are real amplified up here and that's why and and that's that's another thing i should mention is that when we're treating people even when we see physical and objective improvement over time over say 3 4 5 months each time somebody comes in their spots are less sensitive we have to give less treatment we even can bring some of the medication down but their brain is still saying, I'm not better. I'm not better. And th those are the folks that have such a block, such a block around them, this invisible wall that they, they don't want to leave and they don't want anybody to come inside of it because it's dangerous to do that. And when you feel that much danger and you're that much dissociated from the outside world or from your inside of your own body, then it's really hard to make the midbrain believe that actually things are getting better. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, and when I say all that, I'm talking chemical. I'm not talking mental. It can affect your mentality and your, your, your psychology, and it can affect your, affect your emotions, but that's secondary. Almost the opposite of what many people are told. You know, your emotions are causing your problem to mm -hmm. be amplified. It's the other way around. No, Almost all sense. the time. And then, you know, these conditions don't discriminate between somebody who was born with an anxiety issue or was born with depression or was born with that increased likelihood of getting a chronic pain disorder. So it's not just perfectly healthy people that suddenly get these problems. And we're not living in a perfectly healthy world. And a lot of families are not perfectly emotionally healthy or physically healthy either. You know, we have to accept the fact that there's a lot of variables that up and down, up and down that each of us goes through, even if we don't have these problems. Mm -hmm. And if you focus just on your bladder, just on your urethra, and forget that a lot of the sensation may be from other tissues around there, and look at the whole region 
as a very busy regional part of the body, the term chronic regional pain syndrome comes into play, CRPS. Now, most people don't relate that term to the pelvis, but there are people that have written that we're talking about all these disorders in the pelvis being like a chronic regional pain syndrome. Mm -hmm. When we talk about chronic regional pain syndrome, it's similar to fibromyalgia or to some limb injury sometimes where reflex sympathetic dystrophy, where you can hardly touch the skin because it's so, so sensitive. That's called allodynia or hyperalgesia. But we have a lot of people who can't even put underwear on because they're so sensitive around their waistband. They're so sensitive around the vulvar area or around the buttock area that even underwear is too sensitive to have next to their skin. Mm -hmm. And to live like that and also have, you know, uh, also having the need to pee 15 or 20 times a day uh, and one can affect the other, <laughs> uh, that's, that's why we call it complex um, pain. It's, it, it's not just difficult to deal with. It is caused by a number of things that add up and affect each other. Yeah. Literally, literally are hooked together by the nerves that connect them. The bladder, the bowel, the reproductive organs are all going, all that sensation goes into the sacral area once again and can cross over and come down the pudendal branches and affect the vulvar area or affect the penile area in the male. Uh, all of these things are connected. And by looking at it that way as that model of that connection is why I no longer am scared about walking into a room with somebody who's really, really, uh, you know, complex. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of your listeners and even yourself may have walked into doctor's rooms and they look at you like, I have no clue what to do with you. And when doctors or nurses or any practitioners don't know what's going on, we're human beings also. And when we don't know what's going on, we kind of, you know, put, put people off. And often say, well, there's nothing I can do about that. Or we've reached the limit of what we can do. There's nothing more that can be done. All those kinds of things also stick forever in there. When you're told by the big shot at the university hospital or at the Mayo Clinic, there's nothing more we can do. And we really can't give you a diagnosis. I have a lot of patients like that. That actually we, by dissecting out everything that's going on, and actually giving them the appropriate diagnoses, we get them better. Mm -hmm. But if you're told by enough specialists that we don't know what to do with you, uh, that's, that adds on to that dial being up. Yeah, absolutely. I can relate to that because I went to that surgeon that I I told you about in in Philadelphia and had a bad experience there. And then I went to a local, um, I see specialist, um, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And they told me, you know, there's nothing else we can do for you. Your cystoscopy showed nothing at all. So here's the name of three other doctors you can try. And that was a turning point for me. I was so devastated. I felt so hopeless. Like if this specialist can't help me, then who is going to help me? So that did take a toll on me mentally. And I didn't seek treatment again for another two years. Cause I thought, you know, this is it for me. I'm going to have to live like this forever. Yeah. That is not an uncommon scenario where people just don't want to go anymore. Right. And then what do you do? You go to support groups and you go to the internet and, and and then you start not start realizing you don't know what is true and what isn't true, what information is actually helpful and which you shouldn't be listening to. Yes. You know, most everybody means well that are on the support groups, but not everybody that's on the support groups for, for obvious reasons is getting appropriate care. And when you're not getting appropriate care, you're frustrated and you're angry 
and you're upset at the you can get desperate for a and des- and desperate and you and therefore you also have to watch out for what I call the vultures out there in the healthcare system that are will operate on you like that or you know do some very expensive procedures very quickly because mm-hmm. you are desperate yeah and I think everybody that has these issues kind of knows what I'm talking about there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, that, and that's part of what I said at the beginning of 20 years ago, we were looking at a lot of these young women who were getting a first laparoscope uh, because of the suspicion of endometriosis. Because endometriosis is the first thing that most gynecologists think of when people have cyclic pain in the pelvic region. And so, so many people get that scope and they're told if nothing is found, there's nothing wrong with you. Mm -hmm. Even though they may have IC or they may have pudendal neuralgia or may have their psoas muscles going into Charlie horses and they're doubling over in pain and going to the emergency room and getting all the same tests over again. And again, told nothing wrong with you. And the worst example of that is I have actually a patient who had 13 laparoscopies for endometriosis because they did find a couple spots at the beginning and then had a hysterectomy. All that between age 20 and 40 something. By the time I saw her, she had a hysterectomy and was still having the worst pelvic pain ever. Wow. That is a lot. Yeah. And a 15 year old, 16 year old, I'm sorry, had four laparoscopies for endometriosis starting at age 12. That's the youngest I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two in Pittsburgh and two surgeries in Atlanta because they took her to the big shot Atlanta endometriosis surgeon. Mm -hmm. Nobody asked ever what she did from the time she was three or four years old. Up until she, about a year before I saw her, she was part of a gymna, um, cheerleading uh, a cheerleading troop, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, team. Yeah. Cheerleading team that competed with other teams. And she was tiny and she was the one that was thrown up on the top a of the flyer. pyramid. And a flyer. Yeah. Yes. And that never came up with all those people seeing her and doing all those surgeries. And, and, and by the time I saw her, she was being homeschooled before COVID because she couldn't get up out of the chair and she couldn't sit and she couldn't go to regular school. And she was an emotional wreck herself because she could no longer do the cheerleading. She had done that through all the years up until about a year before I saw her. She was still doing that. Mm-hmm. And nobody put it together that she had injuries in her pelvic floor and also, by the way, had IC. Okay. And no, no one had ever asked her about her bladder. Yeah. So how how did you treat her? <laughs> it, it, well, first of all, she ended up. Um, I treated her for a little while. She was from Pittsburgh, and then her mother found a, a pediatric chronic pain center at one of the big hospital systems in Ohio. Um, went over the border to Ohio and, and, and I haven't seen her for a few years, but I understood that she gradually improved because, I mean, she was really, really damaged mm-hmm. emotionally and really damaged, you know, at that, at that young age to be that incapacitated and had been so, had the ability to do all that stuff when she was little. And, that, and that's true for so many of the people that we see now that are in their 30s and 40s they were outstanding athletes or an outstanding, you know, whether they were on teams or whether they were just runners or CrossFit or whatever. And we see a lot of people who are doing CrossFit and all that stuff and still hurting a lot mm-hmm. and, and should learn to moderate that as well. It's hard to tell people to not do something that normally is healthy for most people to do, including some of the nutritional things that you must talk about. You have Mm -hmm. to keep people away from things that the average person would be getting great nutrition from. Right. Yeah. Those typical Uh triggers, like 
the tomatoes yeah. and the citrus and you know, mm-hmm. it might not be forever, but you at least need to restrict them yeah. for a period of time to see if things get better. Yeah. Um, all the all the practitioners, no matter what specialty you are, seeing people with chronic pain have the same kinds of barriers that you have to get through and notice the same things. And, in, and I'll tell you one last story that just comes to my mind. Um, a speech therapist was a patient of mine a few years ago. And when I was sitting there in a live new patient rather than a video, <clears throat> we we're sitting in my office and I was talking to her about how the midbrain and the pelvic floor muscles need to be rewired and retrained uh, and rebooted and whatever words I was using. Um, she, it looked like there was a light bulb that went off above her head. And I said, what are you thinking? <laughs> and she said, <laughs> she said, that's exactly what they taught us in speech therapy. And I said, what do you, what do you mean? And she said, they taught us that we're teaching these kids to reboot their brains to coordinate with the muscles in their throat and in their jaw. All the speech stuff in here needed to be differently uh, balanced Mm -hmm. and rebooted, rebooted. And she made that connection like that because of something I said about the rebooting between here and the pelvic muscles. She said it's the same principle. Yeah, definitely. And I think once you can understand the science behind things, I think that really does start to click for people. I know for yeah. me, I, I read a book called Why Pelvic Pain Hurts. I'm sure you're familiar. Mm-hmm. And it's so simple, but yeah. the concepts are just like, they do such yeah. a great job of explaining exactly what the book is called why public pain hurts and i think after that i was so much more motivated to um learn more and you know get my dial down on my system so it, it's so helpful yeah. one of the another resource for your listeners uh and really what mentored me a lot in learning about chronic pain in general was this whole group from Australia. Um, And I'll give I'll give a few names here because you can YouTube these people. And then when you do that, not only will you see them give some talks, but you will also find others that are in that world. Mm -hmm. So the the biggest one is Lorimer Mosley, Lorimer, L-O-R-I-M-E-R, Mosley, M-O-S-E-L-E-Y. And he's like the, he's a young guy. He's probably only in his forties at this point, but he is, he's, he's entertaining to listen to and he's traveled around the world. I've met him several times at several conferences myself, and he's just a delight, but he and his group of PhD physical therapy people, which is largely the group, David, um, David Butler works with him. They've written a bunch of books. The first one was called Explain Pain. Yep, you had me read that one. I highly recommend it, yeah. <clears throat> and the other name is da- Daniel Clow, C-L-A-U-W. <clears throat> he is a researcher at the University of Michigan who's done tons of research on chronic pain and chronic fatigue disorder at the University of Michigan using fibromyalgia patients as a model for their research. And he also gives some very easily understood talks on YouTube. And people can get a whole lot of reassurance about chronic pain when they hear uh, those people talk <clears throat> and, 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 and work from there. Because so much is involved with the brain interpreting these signals in chronic pain in general as danger, 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 Mm -hmm. that the people in Australia are starting to call the signals danger signals rather than pain signals. Right. Okay. That's, and that's really important to know uh, for people. And, and if you, and, and your midbrain is saying it's dangerous because the volume is so high, how could it not be dangerous? 
that I feel like I have a hot poker in my vagina or a knife going up my rectum or, you know, horrible descriptions like that, which mm-hmm. we hear all the time. Mm-hmm. And people just aren't believed. Okay. But also you recall that just touching with a Q-tip, we, ha- we have some people who say that is a knife going in. Mm-hmm. We have some people who say, oh, that's horrible burn. Well, that's a horrible sandpaper that you're doing on my vaginal opening. And all we're doing is touching. And then we show with a mirror how we're just touching that one tiny little spot. It has so much sensitivity because the nerves are firing off there. And then we treat that spot and treat the whole Mm -hmm. issue and send the PT and do the right nutritional stuff and find out if they have IC. All of those things can work. They're all working together. Right. So everything's connected is one of the, the big things. And one last thing is that a flare is a flare, not going backwards. A flare is a flare. Even though when you're in a big flare, your brain is saying, I'm going back to ground zero. Uh Almost everybody's brain operates like that. That's a protective mechanism. And that's something that everybody with chronic pain needs to realize that your midbrain is overprotecting you with chronic pain. Like the alarm that goes off too easily. Smoke alarm that goes off when your toast burns. Mm -hmm. You don't want that to happen, but you don't throw the alarm away. Right. Because the next day you might have a real fire. Okay. So that's why we have this whole system of acute pain. Because if we were not feeling injuries, that would be dangerous. Mm -hmm. And so when we feel extreme sensitivity and there's actually not active injury going on at this point as long as it's been healed the brain says it's got to be it's got to be really bad and i really have to avoid touching that spot i really have to avoid anything in that area Mm -hmm. that's so fascinating (laughs) i mean i i feel like you and i could just keep on talking all day but you know i'm sure you (laughs) i'm sure you have things to do i have things to do um so i wanted to give you the opportunity to tell everyone who might be interested in being your patient. Are, first of all, are you accepting new patients and how can they contact you if, if you are? Uh, well, first they can go to our website, which is. Um... <laughs> I can put the link in the show notes. <laughs> put the link up. It's uh, uh, my God. It's like the Eckenberg Institute or something. Yeah, like that. You're right. Yeah. yeah. You're right. Just a, <laughs> yeah. That's my age. I'm sorry. Uh, the Eckenberg Institute.com. Mm-hmm. All one word. On there, there is a questionnaire that you can pull up under new patient stuff. And it has a lot of educational stuff on it, um, much more so than most websites. Uh, and a lot of resources are there and so forth. So it's educational to go there. But in order to get an appointment, we insist that people download or send for the questionnaire and we get the questionnaire and then we make the appointment. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sometimes we'll make the appointment right off if somebody is living close and they're promising that we'll come really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, But we don't have, we we don't see thousands of people because we spend a lot of time. And uh, unfortunately we have to be out of pocket. Right. And I have to say that up front because when I was taking insurance and doing all this, the amount of time it takes and the time of education and the time involved with doing all the stuff I talked about today, insurances don't pay for any of that. Right. So I, I would have had to go out of business or not do this program the way I do it if I'd have stayed in. But we're consistently trying to keep the fees low enough for the average person to at least get an assessment and a plan and build their own little team wherever they're from. Because we do take care of people from far away. And a few people we haven't even seen, but we've gotten them significantly better just by educating them and telling them how to find a a pelvic physical therapist and so forth. 
So there is um, a lot to be learned without even coming to see us, but we are trying to see more and more people, especially more locally around the Pennsylvania area, because mm -hmm. it's just easier to take care of people that are closer. And uh, Anna Koopman is the nurse practitioner who's now been working with me for the past year. And she's more and more capable of coming in and doing almost all of the treatments and interviewing and so forth as I am. Uh, so we're going to be mo moving forward. Not, I'm not ready to retire, although I probably <laughs> should pull back a little bit. <laughs> uh -huh. But as you, as you can see and your audience can see, I'm passionate about talking about these things. Very. <laughs> because there's just too many people that are healthy otherwise and need to get the right answers and the right plan and the right diagnosis. You got to be diagnosed appropriately. Otherwise, you're going to be in limbo. Mm -hmm. And even if you have the right diagnosis, you need somebody who understands that diagnosis and how all those things are hooked together that we talked about. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. I absolutely love being your patient. And I think that, you know, it's so worth it to come see you and, you know, all good things from my end. Um, we, I hope to have Anna, your nurse practitioner on at some point and, sure. Um, you should even look into being a podcaster. You, you have a great voice for it and you have a lot to talk about. Maybe that could be like <laughs> your, your retirement gig. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Um, a lot of people have kind of said that I should, I, I, you know, I basically I enjoy talking to the patient world, the general population, but I also do some things in trying to teach uh, practitioners. Mm -hmm other physicians, nurse practitioners, physical therapists, other people in the pelvic pain world. And uh, I just don't want, there, there was a huge amount of activity back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and there were several textbooks on pelvic pain. And I usually start off the lectures when I'm giving a, a slideshow to um, practitioners. I show them pictures of those textbooks because you can't get those textbooks anymore. They're out of print. Mm -hmm. And they actually weren't used in the residency programs. And it's a long story about how the OBGYN residency program really don't supposedly have time, they say, to teach a lot of the stuff we're talking about here because they're limited because they're teaching all these folks to do all the surgeries and they need a lot of time. We actually got that response. Uh, from the International Public Pain Society when we asked the overriding group of OBGYN uh, accreditor people, the big time folks who give the, you know, res you know when you get board certified um, at the highest level, we try to convince them that there at least should be a mini course for pain and for pelvic pain issues, and especially genital pain issues because it affects so many young women. And now I'm finding so many young men as well. Mm -hmm. So various programs should be teaching a lot of the neuroscience that we talked about. Yeah. So any of your listeners and any of us along the way need to pass it forward. Absolutely. Pass it forward. And almost every, almost all of our patients, I mean, you are exceptional because you are doing a podcast and you're still doing your own work and you're still all that. But a lot of people end up saying, when I'm improved and, and now that I am improved, I'm, I know that I'm helping other people because there's so many people in my group of friends who once they hear about it, say, oh, my sister's got that. Mm -hmm. Or my, my mom has had problems for a long time or my cousin or my best friend at school or whatever it might be. So it's, it's important that people get some of this. Right. Okay. And so, get, it, get it right. So true. Definitely. All right. Okay. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my and gosh. <laughs> you keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. I really do appreciate your time and I'm sure everybody else does. So thank you. All right. Take good care. Talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye.